invite you, in body or in spirit, please stand and join with me in our call to worship. With Israel went out from Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language. Judah became God's sanctuary. Israel is the name. The sea looked and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the hills like lions. Why is it, O sea, that you flee? O Jordan, that you turn back? O mountains that you skip like rams, O hills like lions. Tremble, O earth, at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob. This is a true statement to be universally accepted and believed. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. My Christian friends, we can believe this. It is the good news of the gospel. In the person of Jesus Christ, we stand justified. We stand sanctified. Our sins are forgiven.
Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? We're doing okay. All right. Now listen, I'm going to have to be, my, my microphone was not working, so I'm going to have to be loud. I'm not yelling at you. I just am trying to make sure everybody can hear me. Okay. So I want to ask you a question. All right. Um, do you have a favorite food? Yeah, so, oh, what's your favorite food? Heat up broccoli. Heat up broccoli, all right, so you like broccoli. What's your favorite food? Ham. Ham, oh, ham is good. What's your favorite food? So, we had it last night and I fell in love with it. It's a vegetable and you get one with before and it ends with nuts. And it was oh, water chestnuts. Yeah, water chestnuts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we ate. You said we ate it yesterday. I was like, oh, I gotta remember what we ate yesterday. But we did have water chestnuts yesterday, so that's your new favorite food. Okay, what's your favorite food? Ramen and chicken. Ramen and chicken. All right, Rivi, what's your favorite food? Carrot. Carrot. All right, let me ask you this: Do you have a least favorite food? Is there a food you do not like? What's a food you don't like? <coughs> hamburgers. Ham so you like ham, but not hamburgers. Okay. All right. <laughs> What about you? What don't you like? Never sardines. Sardines, all right. Never so ever. pepperoni pizza, sardine. What's the food you don't like? Cooked carrots. Cooked carrots. I hate cooked carrots. <laughs> so you do not like cooked carrots, are you? What's the food you don't like? Watermelon. Watermelon. Okay, all right. Well, listen, let me tell you a story, all right? Because uh, when I was growing up, all right, and this would have been sometime before first grade for me, I had a best friend, his name was Jason Orr, and we went to church together, all right? And um, Jason, we went to an Easter egg hunt, and he won the big prize of the Easter egg hunt, and it was a five pound chocolate rabbit, and they gave it to Jason, and he's like, uh, I don't really like chocolate. All right, I could not understand how somebody could not like chocolate. That's like my brother, he doesn't like he the, I know it was it was weird to me, and I and I started to think, do I even know my best friend Jason Orr? Are we even possibly from the, you know? Can we be friends if he doesn't like chocolate, right? But then you know what? I decided that's silly. He and I can still be friends even if he doesn't like chocolate. What somebody eats or doesn't eat shouldn't affect whether or not we're friends. I'm right? your child, and your child. And do you know that our scripture for today? sort of talks about that because back in um, Jesus' time, they had what were called kosher dietary laws. They weren't allowed to eat just anything. And some people followed those laws and some people didn't. And they were fighting and arguing about whether that was okay or whether it was not okay. But our scripture for today is Paul saying, hey guys, guess what? It's not as important as you think it is. You can still love each other. You can still get along. You don't all have to eat the same things don't all have to not like the same things, right? As long as you agree with what's important, then you're going to be okay, all right? I'm a child, and I don't like chocolate. Can you accept that? I can accept that. All right, so let's pray and ask God for help with that. I'll say some words, and you all repeat after me. Dear God, Dear God, God help us, help us to, be accepting to be accepting of the differences of the differences of others. Of others. And we pray this. Yes. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, now you can head down to children's worship with Miss Carolyn or go back and sit with your parents. Miss Carolyn's here. All right, walk, please. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right, let's go.
As God is glorified by the prayer of the anthem, may God also be glorified by the proclamation of his word. Let us pray. Gracious God, we recognize that of our own accord, we would be unable to discern the depth, the broadness, the hallowedness of the words that you speak to us this day and the love that you reveal for us in your written word. We pray that by your spirit you will become your own interpreter, writing your word, not only on the sacred page, but in our hearts, enlivening your word within our souls, that they become for us the very living presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, living and breathing through our breath, through our heartbeats, through our hands and our feet, Speak to us your word this day. Empower us to go forward into the world, engrafted in your word, engrafted in your love, that all might know the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ, in all that we say and do. This we pray in Christ's most holy name. Amen. There are two scripture lections for today. They come, of course, from the lectionary reading assigned for this day. Um, our uh, secondary reading will be the Gospel reading, the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 35. Uh, Jesus here has uh, been speaking so far about uh, forgiveness, about the nature of forgiveness. We see that the Apostle Peter comes to Jesus and in his generosity asks Jesus, okay, you're talking about, uh, in the previous passage, uh, in this same chapter, uh, Jesus was telling the disciples that if, uh, if someone sins uh, in the church, go to them privately, talk to them about it. Uh, if they won't listen to you, maybe take a, a witness with you to talk about it. All for the purpose of trying to build restoration, reconciliation, so that we can all live together in community and uh, find a way to live by the rules that families live by. Uh, now, a continuing theme of forgiveness and repentance Peter, following up on what Jesus said, asks Jesus generously, how many times should I forgive? Seven times? Peter's considering that generous, and it is generous. But Jesus' code, if you will, for forgiveness is incalculable. Um, and I'm impressed that I was able to say that word. Joel, Joel and I were uh, debating as to whether or not we could actually say incalculable without screwing up. So I think I got it. Did it sound right? Incalculable. Okay. Um, it is, um, uh, uh, he says, it depends on your translation, Jesus uh, says, forgive 70 times 7, or 77 times. It depends, uh, you can translate it either way from the Greek. Um, but uh, the, Jesus is being exaggerated, uh, but, not, uh, but he's being serious at the same time. Uh, forgiveness is uh, beyond the measure. We continue to forgive. That's what we do in a community of faith. And he uses this parable that's about to follow to illustrate forgiveness. And I want to uh, make sure we're clear on the reading of this parable. The parable is a demonstration of what uh, God's forgiveness is not. Because the, uh, a lot of people want to associate the king in this parable with God. Please don't do that because the, uh, it's not to say that this is how God operates in the parable. The whole parable isn't designed to show us the flaw in not forgiving as God forgives. 
With that as our introduction, my Christian friends, listen for the word of God. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay him what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their lord all that had taken place. Then his lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his lord handed him over to be tortured until he should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Hear now this second reading, our primary reading, from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, Romans 14, 1 through 12. Here Paul is coming to the conclusion of his writing to the church at Rome, and he wants to spell out the nature of living in community as Christians in the church in Rome, and how it is that forgiveness and refraining from judgment of one another is the way of life for the Christian. And uh, it's illustrated in what uh, Joel was telling the children. Uh, you'll see stories in here about, uh, uh, about dietary rules, uh, eating and not eating, and how people will pass judgment on what people eat or what days they celebrate. <coughs> and it may not seem clear to the 21st century reader, but what Paul is talking about are um, particularly particular holidays or, or holy days that people set aside for observances. Some people uh, set aside certain dates uh, for uh, their celebrations, while others don't. That should not be the measure of what counts as Christian fellowship, Paul is saying. Don't judge people on, on uh, what days they observe and whether they observe the same days you observe. Or don't judge them on what they eat. In fact, he, he talks about those who will eat only vegetables as opposed to those who will eat meat. It's a reference to the fact that uh, some Christians have difficulty understanding, um, in a pagan world, buying food in the Roman market. Uh, meats were sacrificed in honor of certain deities that did not exist. And so some Christians, uh, believing that there would be uh, a, a, a God, our God being upset with us if we ate food dedicated to a false God, uh, then that would bring judgment upon us. Whereas other Christians are thinking that God doesn't exist, so it doesn't matter. Um, still, the Christians should not judge where people are in their spiritual life. That's the point that Paul is making. Um, he wants to make clear that no matter who you are um, in your life or in death, you belong to God. God is the only one who judges. God did not send any one of these fellow Christians to be the judge of another. That's the point he wants to make. Listen once again. The Word of God, Romans chapter 14, 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. 
Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed all, of, has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is therefore, it is before their uh, Lord, their own Lord, that they stand or fall, and they will be held for, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced of their, in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. And also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live for ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again. So that he might be Lord of both the living, of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brothers or sisters? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will be accountable to God. Amen and may God give us to understand these readings in his holy word. This is the word of the Lord. You know, righteousness, my Christian friends, is one of the, the, the key elements of, of Christian faith. Uh, righteousness is... a uh, um, again, sometimes it sounds, uh, it, I'll just say it's one of those Sunday words, it's one of those uh, church words, but it basically means being right with God. That's the simple meaning of the word righteous. To be righteous is simply to be right with God. Something we all desire, right? <laughs> we all desire to be right with God. This is the whole point of what Paul's talking about. Justification by faith. Justification, righteousness, they're actually the same word in Greek. Justification by faith. Uh, it is by faith that we're made right with God. And therefore, it should be what makes us right with one another. If we're right with God, who is uh, the judge of us all, the father of us all, and if we're brothers and sisters to each other, shouldn't we be right with each other if we're right with God? This is what Paul, this is the whole, I mean, if I were to sum up everything that Paul writes in all of his letters, it would be that. It would be that message. Paul argues that true righteousness can come only from the truly righteous one, God. It's Righteousness is not ours to, to practice of our own merits. If we have any righteousness in us, it's because it comes from God. It's, we, cannot, this, we cannot make ourselves right with God uh, by, uh, by anything we human beings do. We just can't do it simply because we're broken. And again, Paul's gone through that long, drawn-out explanation, as we can, we've heard many sermons about this before, that human beings, even in the effort of trying to make themselves right with God, is doing, we are doing so out of an act of selfishness, and, uh, and therefore there's the paradox, we, we can't make ourselves right with God. So how do we get right with God? He decides to declare us or reckon us as righteous through Jesus Christ. That's what Paul, that's what Paul is saying. You don't do it. God does it for you. Thanks be to God. Our righteousness comes from God. If we dare to depend on our own righteousness to be right with God, this is what he refers to as self-righteousness. And that's what this passage is about. Practicing our own self-righteousness when we judge others based on our own standards, using ourselves as the measuring rod of what righteousness is. The danger of self-righteousness is its tendency, to, its tendency to make our own convictions the measure of validity. It's to make our own convictions 
the measure of everyone else. That's the danger of self-righteousness. A lot of people think, well, it's just a personal matter. Okay, maybe I'm a bit self-righteous. But the danger in self-righteousness is that it tends to lead you to measure everybody else by your standards, not by God's. That's the danger of self-righteousness. That's what Paul's worried about with the, Christ, with the Christian community in Rome when he writes this letter. Because of this, self-righteousness is a threat to Christian unity. Not only in Rome, by the way, the reason this letter has survived the test of time and has come down to us here in the 21st century in Richmond is precisely because this is a universal problem for all Christians. Even today, you know, we still haven't got it yet. It's, we're, we're still, we still remain a work in progress, my Christian friends. Self-righteousness remains a threat. And if you want to know how, Paul gives three reasons in the, in the formation of, of these paragraphs that I've read. Uh, uh, number one, a Christian is a servant of God, a member of God's household. If God accepts such a person, then none are in a position to condemn God's acceptance. It does not matter whether you agree with this person's theological views or ethical views or uh, their, their status in life or whatever their orientation is. It doesn't matter. If this person is accepted by God, who are you to decide that they are not? That's one of the dangers of self-righteousness. A second one. Although one Christian practice may differ from others, all practices share the same root, according to Paul. That common root, all Christians, all servants, live for God, not themselves. As long as people are doing what they do in honor of God, who are we to judge them? If we end up judging them, it's because we're convinced that our own convictions, our own self-righteousness, becomes the measure. A third thing, three re uh, the third reason of, uh, uh, that self-righteousness is that threat to Christian unity, it is not in our purview to judge anyway. God is the one who judges, not us. God didn't send Jesus Christ into the world to condemn it. He certainly didn't send me in it, into the world to condemn it, and I'm going to assume he didn't send you into the world to condemn it. If Jesus Christ himself doesn't condemn the world or others, why should we? It's not our place. We are servants of God. We are not God. I am a Christian. I am a Christ person. I am not Christ. To set ourselves up as judge is an arrogation of ourselves and what belongs to God. In effect, my Christian friends, self-righteousness really is a form of, think about it this way, it's a form of self-idolatry. It's a way of worshiping yourself. Self-righteousness is the danger of setting up something other than God as God, namely yourself. It's a form of idolatry. Besides, Paul tells us that we stand in judgment ourselves. Now, this sounds like an odd thing, doesn't it? That, to, to think about the fact that we stand, in, uh, uh, we Christians are always uh, telling ourselves because we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior that suddenly uh, the judgment is removed and uh, we, we're not judged by God anymore. But that is not at all the case. Judgment is still coming upon us, but not for the reasons you think. A lot of, a lot, you know, um, um, we have a lot going on in our lives to even begin to worry about judging others. I've got, I've got enough of uh, problems in my own sinfulness uh, before God to, to worry about judging others. Uh, I should uh, uh, be worried about how God judges me more so than I'm concerned with whether or not you're living up to the standards that I think God is going to apply to you. Let God be the judge. Let God judge. And God does judge, according to Paul. And I want you to, be, uh, to, to see how this works. We are judged not because we are worried about our salvation. I think that's a myth that, that sometimes is portrayed. And it's led people in Christianity to think that God, who is the great judge, no longer judges Christians because they have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, by his sacrifice, by his resurrection. And so we are liberated from the power of sin. God doesn't judge us by those sins anymore. And that is not quite correct. He does judge us 
but not to the point of deciding whether or not we have our salvation. If we are in Christ, of course we have our salvation. But the judgment is not about whether or not we, we get the prize at the end of the race, my Christian friends, whether we are, uh, whether we are going to receive the, uh, the reward of eternal life once we die. I'm here to tell you, my Christian friends, speaking as a Presbyterian, speaking as one who feels confident in Scripture, we have it. God loves you. He has given you salvation through Jesus Christ. You have it. God is not judging you on whether or not you deserve salvation. The simple truth is you don't, but you've got it. No, the judgment is whether or not we're acting in the very love of God himself. I mean, I'm not, when I, when I engage in the world to act in a way that I think would be pleasing to God, when I do things to honor God, I'm not doing it in order to receive a gift, I, like I'm working and somehow or other I get paid in the afterlife with, with the eternal life. No, no. I do the things I do without regard to the salvation. I've already got that. I do it for nothing more than the love and honor of God. That's why I do it. That's why we all do it. We've got our salvation. Now, are we, if, if we love God, are we going to practice that love? If we honor God, are we going to practice that honor? That's, that's what we should be asking ourselves. That's the judgment that God offers. Not a judgment whether or not we have our salvation. It's a judgment of whether or not we're acting sincerely in what we say we're going to do. Honestly, my Christian friends, that's what Paul's talking about. It's not about us. It's about what we do for God, for our love for God and God's people. Do I honor God by helping you, by loving you, by serving you? I don't do it for salvation. I've got that. I do it because I love God. That's where the judgment part comes in. It's, think about this. Think of it this way. We're told that we're not supposed to judge others, and so you might ask yourself, why did God create us so that we have this, this power within us to judge? Every human being does it, right? Every human being has this default position where we want to judge others because somehow or other we think they don't measure up to something. Falsely or, or, or uh, you know, correctly or incorrectly, we, we, uh, we, we judge people. The gift of judgment that God gives us is not meant for us to judge others. It's meant for us to assess ourselves. Am I doing everything I should be doing to honor God? Not for salvation, but because it's the right thing to do. Because it honors the God whom I love. That's what the gift of judgment's for. Judgment is not something I apply to others. Judgment is what I'm supposed to apply to myself. That's why judgment is a gift, because it allows me to keep myself in check in the course of my spiritual discipline. That may sound exhausting to keep constantly having to check yourself to make sure that you are serving God in the most loving way you can, the most honorable way you can, the most righteous way you can. But that's why it's called discipleship. It is a constant work, 24-7, to be the best person I can be. Not for the reward, but because it's the right thing to do. Because I love God, I love you. That's what Paul is saying. Sounds like a pretty good message, my Christian friend. It sounds like um, a wonderful call of stepping aside from the self-righteousness that plagues us all. The judgment that I would apply to myself is exactly that. For myself. That's what the Christian life is about. Constantly assessing whether or not I'm doing it the best way I can for God. Not worrying about whether or not somebody else is doing it right for God. That's between them and God. Am I doing it well enough to say I'm a better person today for God's sake than I was yesterday? I'm not trying to be a better Christian than you. I'm trying to be a better Christian than I was yesterday. Amen, and may God bless this witness to the glory of his name.
our Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Your judgment is a reckoning for us to continue the discipline, to continue the work of faithful service to you and to others. Give us the power to be forgiving. Give us the power to repent. Give us the power to be accepting of one another. Help us to realize that differences are the way you've created us and that others do not need to be like us in order to be acceptable to you. If they are acceptable to you, may we find it in our hearts for them to be acceptable to us as well. Empower us that we might be able to love one another just as Christ loved us. For even as we owed a great debt through sin to you, you did not regard that as something to exploit. You emptied yourself in the form of your Son for nothing more than the love that you have for us. As mysterious as your love is for us, may we also, by that same mystery, love one another. Empower us to learn to live together in harmony and in truth. This we pray. In the name of the Christ of our faith, he who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this point in our service of worship, we recognize the great sacrifice that God has made for us in his Son, Jesus Christ, loving us beyond love, loving us when we are unlovable, accepting us even while we were enemies of God. May we also recognize his great sacrifice in our own sacrifice to one another. May that be something we reflect upon during the time of the offertory and in the practice of our giving.